I am very excited about what I see happening in Stop 6. Years ago, we had plans, and people said, you know, nothing's going to happen. But if you hold on, if you respect previous leadership, you can get a path to success. And that's why I'm so glad Councilman Frank Moss is here this morning. Frank, is Frank in the room? Please. You need to know a lot of things happening in Stop 6 are happening because of the vision Frank had. I will tell you the first time I ever heard the word natatorium connected to Stop 6 came from Councilman Frank Moss. Now, who'd have thunk it? And we're going to have one. But recently, we were on a, a Zoom call, and this call was hosted by Fort Worth Housing Solutions, and I'll tell you how we all work together now. But there was someone who wrote in a very innocent, well-meaning question. And that question basically was, how can you talk about this hub and you have not had meetings with the people in Stop 6? <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there have been years of meetings. And so for those of you who are familiar with Bible study, I'm going to take you back a little bit. There was a man named John the Baptist I learned about in Sunday school. I'm a rowdy Baptist, OK? <laughs> Baptist folk can get mad at you and build a church right next door to yours because there is no order. We are rowdy. But John the Baptist had a whole bunch of good news for people. And they thought, oh, he's the one who's been promised. But he wasn't. He was the forerunner to the Christ. And so back in 2009 is when I attended a meeting that Frank had at Ebenezer. And we were around a table. And I think we, we were looking at what was called the Stop 6 Revitalization Plan. I think that's what he called it. Well, that led to something else. And in, in more modern times, we ended up with the Strategic Neighborhood Improvement Plan. Is that what we call it, Dana? I think it was when David just threw money at different communities. And so the, the Strategic Neighborhood Improvement Plan was not the grand plan, but it really was a forerunner to what you see today, which is the Stop 6 Choice Neighborhood Initiative. It takes time, it takes planning, and it takes people to want to be involved. But for me, it all started with Council Member Frank Moss. Now, when the Strategic Neighborhood Improvement came along, you know, we, we had money because the city manager, who was new at the time, wanted to see what could he do to improve the quality of life in underserved neighborhoods. And how he got to that was me taking him on a tour of my district. I didn't show him Bell Helicopter or Lakes of River Trails. I showed him Stop 6 where I grew up. We went to Burdell, and we went to uh, what was called Calumet. We interrupted a guy smoking crack. And at that point, the city manager thought, I better get out of the car because she's going to get killed. And I can't have a, a council member getting killed because she's starting to fight with somebody smoking crack. <clears throat> well, that plan planted the seed and made us grant worthy. Then comes along a new CEO for what we call the Fort Worth Housing Authority, which is now Fort Worth Housing Solutions. But just like me, she had a good plan and a vision laid out for, from her predecessor twice, that being Barbara Holston. So when we were able to get this $36 million grant, which, oh, David, I just talked about you and us interrupting the guy smoking crack. <laughs> Everyone, that's our city manager, David Cook. Please give him a round of applause. <laughs> and so when, 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 when Mary Margaret got together and put her, her legal head into work, we were able to craft a big grant application that was just perfect at the time. But don't forget, all this work has been done by those building up to this, OK? So what you need to know is Mary Margaret was able to write a grant, history from Barbara, support from Brian, her, her number two, Ace Boone Coon, who's been there for years. And we got this $36 million grant from the Trump administration. We, before, before Mary Margaret came, I took Ben Carson on tours of Cavill. And what he liked was the fact that we had a neighborhood police substation in Cavill. He didn't know it had been shut down for years. 
but we had just re <laughs> we worked it, okay? But that resonated with him, and he came back to Fort Worth three more times. Two, though, two of those, I hosted him twice, Betsy hosted him twice, but Mary Margaret comes along, we get the grant. Okay, Trump administration is gone. Biden administration comes in, the flow of money continues. What I'm trying to get you to see is it takes time, it takes planning, it takes diligence, and it takes people to vote. Because but for the bond issue, we would not have the hub. And so the hub is what I call the shining star of stop six. But there are so many hubs and things like that coming up, we got many shining stars. One reason is because the Fort Worth Housing Solutions team owns a whole bunch of property. And what they do with it works to the benefit of citizens everywhere. So this meeting is gonna bring you up to date. And for those who ask the question, why haven't we met with stop six people? I want you all to tell them there have been meetings. You've been there. You, you actually got people to vote for the hub. So that's my introduction. And what I want to do, I just realized if reading is fundamental, Sonia, I didn't read the agenda. And so I'm, what I'm gonna do is ask you to come up because one person who helped us convene a lot of meetings is gonna be recognized now. Please welcome Sonia Singleton, the Assistant Director of Neighborhood Services. This meeting is being recorded, so you gotta talk into that mic. And she's a PK, so she'll be able to talk to the right. microphone. Good morning. Good morning. The center coordinator here was Paula Yvonne Jackson. <clears throat> Paula passed away on July the 14th, unexpectedly. She was a servant leader, an advocate for those who were often unheard and unseen. She believed in excellence in everything she presented for the community. And she was determined that patrons of the Martin Luther King Jr. Community Center would have access to innovative and quality recreational, cultural, educational, and social programs. She had many worthwhile life accomplishments. One, her apple of her eye was her daughter, Rachel. But she was also a part of many uh, professional organizations. She served as an officer or a board member or volunteer. We will miss her bright smile and her jovial request for $5 each time we ask her a question. <laughs> we will move forward to keep her vision for the programs that we, will, that we will, will be offered at Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King Jr. Replacement Community Center, otherwise known as the Stop Six Hub. Thank you for joining us today. Now, even though staff gave me an agenda, I'm going to go off, strip, off script a little bit, okay? Because all the checks that are written by the city <laughs> are written by this man. And I want David Cook to speak to you, and I want him followed by assistant city manager, everybody's friend, Fernando Costa, and then we'll get back on agenda. David, thank you and your bride for being with us today. I know it's Saturday. No, oh, thank you. It's good to see everybody. How's everybody doing today? Good. It's cooler in here. <laughs> I think we'll stay here all day. Uh, Gene asked me to speak about a little bit about the neighborhood improvement program, and she said she told you the story about I got to drive around with her, and I stayed in the car when she got out. <laughs> did she did she tell you that part of the story? No. I wasn't gonna get out of the car. And I'm thinking, I haven't even been here two months and I might be killed. But one of the first things I did when uh, it was a pleasure coming here about nine years ago is riding around with council members. And where do council members take you when they want you to see the district? They take you to the neighborhoods. And they want you to see the neighborhoods uh, that they feel responsible for. And they might not take you to the n nicest neighborhoods if that if that rings true right they want you you to see some of the neighborhoods that might be struggling a little bit and how the city might be able to help out and so one of the things we started a number of years ago and i guess we're about seven or eight years in is on the neighborhood improvement program 
And we identify a neighborhood each year that we want to come in and provide some assistance and some capital money. And now it's to the tune of about $4 million a year. We come in to a neighborhood all around the city. Uh, I know Stop 6 was the first one. Ash Crescent was the second one. I'm going to forget a few. Northside, Como, Rosemont. Um, at Las Vegas Trail, thank you. And I think one of the neat things about that program is our focus is on listening and that we want to hear from the neighborhood of what they think is important. And what has been interesting to me is each neighborhood is different in how they want to use that money. Uh, so we don't come in with a prescribed way of saying, it. oh, we're from government, we know what you need. It's, uh, it's in the spirit of we want to help we have this money, what do you think the needs of the neighborhood are most important? And then let's go from that point forward. So it's been very popular uh, over the last seven years. We think we've made a difference in some of those neighborhoods and we're still working in those neighborhoods. Uh, it's, it's finally occurred to us that it is so successful, it's so popular that we might need to increase the investment so hypothetically, next Tuesday's recommended budget hits the table, and this hypothetical budget may include two neighborhood improvement programs each year. So we're going to double up the money. We'll recommend to the city council that we double up the money. I'm not sure she knew that. I did not. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's time to circle back around. Uh, okay. <laughs> But, but, I, but I also think that neighborhood improvement program is one of the reasons we're here today, one of the reasons we got the 30 some million from the federal government and we've got new private investment that's interested in the area. Uh, and so, yes, we get to recommend next week that we double that money up and we'll start doing two neighborhoods each year with council approval. And so, man, I feel pretty good now. I'm leaving the podium. Fernando. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Cook. Well, you've heard from Councilmember Bivens and uh, City Manager Cook about one of the main reasons Stop 6 has been making so much progress, and that's public engagement and community empowerment, working with the community to make decisions about the neighborhood's future. But another important component of that success, I think, is cooperation among multiple agencies. And Councilman Bivens asked me to say a word about it because it goes back a long way, just as public engagement goes back a long way here in Stop 6. And that's evidenced by the presence here of several leaders from Forward Housing Solutions, led by uh, Mary Margaret Levins. Uh, Mary Margaret has been uh, a stalwart of uh, cooperation uh, across Fort Worth and particularly here in Stop 6. And without that partnership between the city and Forward Housing Solutions, I'm sure we would not have gotten the $35 million uh, federal grant. Uh, that was a, a big part of it. Uh, and uh, Mary Margaret and her staff, uh, Brian and Sonia and uh, others, have uh, exemplified uh, servant leadership uh, in working with the community. I think uh, folks who live here will testify to that effect. And so uh, we've been working. We have a a stop six working group that's been meeting uh, periodically for the past several years. Uh, and uh, it's not just the city and housing solutions, but it's uh, Tarrant County College, it's the Fort Worth Independent School District, it's Trinity Metro, it's all the entities that touch upon uh, stop six. And so we have every reason uh, to feel confident about the future of this community. You're gonna be hearing in a minute uh, from uh, Victor Turner, our neighbor services director, 
uh, and, from, uh, and from Mary Margaret about the background of this project uh, uh, and the, the uh, guiding plan which the community helped us to formulate, uh, which is the uh, Cavill Place Top 6 uh, Neighborhood Transformation Plan, uh, which is the basis upon which uh, we're making all these improvements. It's not as though we started from scratch. Uh, uh, we've done a lot of homework. Uh, and so we were ready uh, when we launched uh, the uh, neighbor improvement program that Mr. Cook described. Uh, it was evident that Stop 6 should be the first neighborhood uh, to benefit from it. Why? Because the needs were here, but more than just the needs, the potential was here. The community was ready for action. Uh, and uh, so all of that groundwork paid off. And it's going to pay off even more uh, in, in the years ahead. Uh, you can see the progress we're making with Cowan Place. Uh, can you imagine that? Uh, you can see it. Uh, when we, when Councilmember Bivens uh, began talking a few years ago about Cowan Place, I bet the very few people actually believed that was going to happen because they'd heard these promises before. It's happening. And that's just phase one. And Mary Margaret will tell you more about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I am confident that I need Mary Margaret and Victor at the table. They got two chairs there. I'm just thinking y'all going to do this together. Can y'all do that? OK. Let me, let me talk to the citizens while Victor and Mary Margaret are coming. And Mary Margaret, I'll, I'll move my purse out the way. The hub is very important to me. I have been holding out on moving forward with plans for the hub because I felt pressured from entities who want, everybody wants to be in the hub, okay? You know, they, they see the building, oh, look what it is, we want to be there. Well, I told the city manager, and we, we talk about this, what, did David really leave? <laughs> okay, okay, <laughs> I didn't see him. I, 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 I tell you, every meeting we have, David, Whatever services we had at MLK, I want to see those at the hub. And so I've been assured that those services will transfer to the hub. But I'm real paranoid, and I have, I have trust issues. And so my next question was, OK, are we going to have the space we need, or are we going to be in closets, or do we have to fight where we put our purses like I had to do for Hand and Meadowbrook when we expanded that? So one thing David said that I hadn't even thought about, he said, well, you know, one group that should be in the hub is MHMR, and that's because he's realizing all the trauma you know, that, that we go through here in Stop 6. Uh, for those of you who live in Stop 6, how many of you hear gunshots at least five nights a week? I'm one. Trauma. How many of you hear sirens? Yeah, yeah. So without even studying, our city manager came up with that as a likely tenant, if you will. What I want you all to be doing throughout this entire meeting is making notes as to who you think. Vicki, I'm glad you're here. What time is it? OK. Just because you, reti yeah. you retired from MLK here. And I know Sylvia got you up to get you here as early as you are here. Thank you. But I want you all to be thinking, what needs to be in the hub? What, what needs to be there? Now, we know Child Care and Associates is going to be there. Where's, where's Willie? Child Care and Associates will be there, and I think they've got 9,000 square feet. I need to know what you want to see. I don't want to leave office because I've told all y'all, I am leaving. This, this is it, okay? I am leaving office with this term. I don't want to have to look back and hear that there was something that should have been said that wasn't. Now, this isn't Christmas time, and you don't have a Christmas list to create. But you do have the responsibility to help protect your neighborhood, our neighborhood. What should be there? Now, we know, thanks to the vision from Councilmember Moss, we're going to have an auditorium there. Now, that is for all citizens, right, David? We, we, we can't just say, give me your stop six card, you get a note. That's going to be everywhere. But that's like Handley. People from all over Fort Worth use that ball field all the time. And so I think more people coming to stop six will bridge some barriers, OK? But while you're here, be thinking about what services need to be there. 
And if you can write something down, give it to that guy in that yellow shirt. Give it to Josh. Don't tell me I'm not going to remember anything when I leave here and get to the next meeting. So that's what I want to hear from you, your family, your friends, even folk you don't like. This is the time that we need to solidify the input as to what's going to be there for me. And so now we get back on program. Now, I don't know who said we were going to be here till 1. Who, who, did, who did that? I mean, was that a typo? It wasn't? I'm not going to be here till 1, OK? No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> mm -mm. This is not a Church of God and Christ convocation. <laughs> Ain't nobody got on white? And we'll be out of here hopefully by, we started at what time, 10? I'd say about 11, 11, 15, 11.30, be OK. So I want you to meet Victor Turner, who is our Director of Neighborhood Services. I call him Deacon Turner. My friend, Mary Margaret Lemons, President of Fort Worth Housing Solutions. When we first started this journey, Mary, Mar Mary Margaret's an attorney, OK? And so attorneys are used to analyzing and just getting stuff done, but not pretty much being out there on the stuff with a can. And so Mary Margaret needed to, to get some money. And so early on, you know, I would help her go around and, and beg, we were begging for dollars. Well, she got so good at this, she just starts calling people. And it, it's amazing to see the passion that she has for this community. Mary Margaret made co-compliance do a drive-through because she was not happy with the properties that they had invested in and how co-compliance was, I guess they didn't see stuff till you showed it to them, you think? Well, I have my issues with code, and everybody knows that. But you know, what we'll do now is welcome and listen to, and everything you hear is very important. Everything you hear is very important. So with that, please welcome my two friends, Mary Margaret and Victor, and I'll move the big old purse out the way. Please applaud. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Bivens. Um, I guess she put Deacon out there, so I'll behave, I guess. So uh, I'll do my best. Um, <clears throat> some of you, you heard the word choice neighborhood, and really, what is that? Um, we know that over the years, HUD has invested in, in neighborhoods that had distressed uh, public housing, and the purpose is to redevelop that housing and the neighborhood surrounding it. Prior to Choice was a program called Hope Six, and it was housing opportunities for persons everywhere. Choice was first funded in 2010. Uh, it is a program that cities and public housing authorities work together uh, to bring public investment into a community. And we want to say that in Fort Worth, that 35 million from HUD, along with over 40 million in Fort Worth. Uh, Housing Finance Corporation and City of Fort Worth dollars uh, equates to over a $450 million investment over the next seven years. So you can see we're less than $100 million as four times that amount. So we're proud of that and the program. There are three main pillars, housing, neighborhood, and people. Mayor Margaret will talk a little bit about that. We'll get to the hub and uh, kick it off. Mayor Margaret. Well, I'm going to go back just a little bit so everybody gets the full picture. I joined the Housing Authority in 2015, and at that time, um, the Housing Authority in the city had agreed upon and both passed, both City Council and my board had passed um, a 2013 transformation plan. And so that was done with city or with the community's engagement and input. And we started to work on that. So when I got here and hit the ground running, we were applying for tax credits. And at that time, the neighborhood did not qualify for any of the state financing due to um, some of the neighborhood characteristics. So um, those included poverty rates, low educational attainment, crime, blight. And so the, the typical funding sources that we would use to rebuild housing or to build new housing weren't available to us. And Cabell Place, unfortunately, was contributing to that. So many of you know Cabell Place was 300 units of public housing built in 1953. And it had fallen in disrepair because HUD does not fund capital improvements for public housing. So the federal government readily admits that they do not give us enough money to make capital improvements to existing public housing. So we had applied for a program called Rental Assistance Demonstration to be able to transfer those um, units to a different funding source to try to rebuild them. Um, but there were still major gaps at that time. I can remember sitting at... Um, 
um, Ebenezer Baptist in the gymnasium over there at Brighter Outlook, and, and Jonathan was there, and we were having community meetings about how we were going to get this done, because everybody wanted us to make a change at Cavill. We just couldn't figure out the funding. Um, and so fast forward to 2018, and the crime had gotten so bad at Cavill that I honestly didn't feel comfortable having families still live there. And so we asked for permission um, to demolish Cavill and to move our residents using a housing choice voucher. And so we had done a study. It needed $43 million worth of uh, capital improvements. And the crime rates were those that we couldn't you know, be sustainable. And so HUD approved that um, application for us, and we began the relocation process. But the Housing Authority has always been committed to the Stop Six community. We understand that we are um, a big part of it, and we've been here for you know, many decades. And so immediately after getting that approval, we started thinking about what can we do to, to bring it back and bring it back in a better way, a more sustainable way. And so um, we decided that we would go after a Choice Neighborhood Award. And these are pretty hard to get, you guys. So every year HUD gives out somewhere between four and six across the nation. But there's multiple applications that come in from all over the nation. And typically, you get a planning grant. You get a small planning grant of a few hundred thousand dollars, and you work for a few years, and you get a plan together, and then you go after the implementation grant of 30, 40, 50 million dollars. Well, we didn't do it that way because we didn't want to wait three more years for Stop Six. And so we took the plan from 2013, and um, we brushed it off, and we started having community meetings. And we held a ton of community meetings. I think the pictures are behind me. So you can see we had full rooms, and we invited everybody from our Cavill residents to neighborhood associations, we had faith-based leaders there. We had the educational leaders. Anybody and everybody that touched Stop 6 or wanted to touch Stop 6, we invited. We had meetings with five-year-olds. We had meetings, I mean, it was on and on. And so we developed a new plan, and we submitted that in, in 2019. Um, we were shortlisted, and on Valentine's Day of 2020, right before the pandemic, we hosted a HUD tour here at Dunbar High School and took HUD all around Stop 6 for the entire day. And then um, a couple of months later, after we were all in lockdown and we, we learned by Zoom, um, we got that $35 million. And so we thought it was big money, right? $35 million sounds like a lot. Um, but I remember David Cook saying, you're telling me that the city's going to commit $50 million <laughs> of money as leverage for $35 million from the federal government? And I'm not a math major, you guys. I, I don't do math. But um, I, <laughs> he was right. It was a lot of money that the city was committing, but we knew other funding sources would come to the table. And so when Victor says $450 million are going to be the, probably the total investments, I think he's being shy. It's going to be half a billion dollars at least um, because we've already gotten other people to sign on. And so we started working immediately. We went after those tax credits. Um, we won a tax credit award. We won now three tax credit awards. We just got one last week. Um, and so, and you see the, you see the building happening. Cowan Place is 87% done and we'll be starting to lease there in the fall. But our plan isn't just about housing, it's about neighborhood and people. And so those are the three pillars of a Choice Neighborhood Grant. Every resident at Cavill Place gets case management for six years. So those families have a personal um, manager working with their family to work on education, healthcare, financial literacy, economic empowerment, all of those things to get them in a better place. Um, and then the housing, we're not just building back 300 units, we're building back 1,000 units, and it's mixed income housing. So yes, we're going to replace those subsidized units, unit for unit, but we're going to actually come in with mixed income housing. So we'll have workforce housing and market rate housing that's completely unrestricted so everybody can come back to Stop 6 and have a beautiful place to call home that's safe and a neighborhood of choice where you're going to want to live. Um, and so we actually had to expand our real estate in Stop 6 to be able to do that. It's not just going back on Cavill Place land. C uh, Cowan was a piece of land we purchased. We purchased land at Amanda and um, Rosedale for Hughes House. And then down at Miller and Rosedale, we have another site. And then if you go on Ramey and, um, Ramey and Hughes, we have a, a, another site. So we have actually spread out the housing throughout the community and we want it all to be a part of making this community more sustainable. So, um, like I said, we've gotten three tax credit awards. We've got three phases underway. Uh, we'll start on our fourth phase. Uh, Brian, he didn't get that white overnight. It's been a few years, but he's starting on the fourth phase in the next, next couple of months. Um, and we're really excited because we see the change happening. So 
we, when we were talking to the neighborhood, we knew that we needed more space because every time when Gina said we had Ben Carson come to town or other dignitaries and we needed to have events, we actually would come here to this community center and we'd have to displace another activity because we didn't have enough room. And so I can remember coming in the summer when we had freedom schools or when we had seniors for feeding programs or playing dominoes, and we literally would have to tell people that they couldn't do what they were supposed to be doing that day and they needed to move to a different location. And so we knew that this space wasn't going to be big enough. I mean, if you try to park in the parking lot on a busy day, it can be challenging. And so we wanted to make sure that we could welcome everybody to Stop 6 with the resources <laughs> there. And so we started calling it a hub because it was more than a community center. Um, and we, you know, those sessions with the community really led to what people wanted. If we heard pool once, we heard it 50 times, right? We know that Tarrant County has a horrible rate of drownings, and we want to be able to teach swim lessons and to be able to prevent those because that's a completely preventable death. Um, and so some of the partners like Child Care and Associates have been in the neighborhood. They've been here for more than 40 years. They had four locations within our two-mile area, and the only, they had a location right in front of Rosedale Plaza Park that they um, moved those resources during COVID to other locations because our residents were gone, and so they didn't have as many families to serve in the neighborhood. And so um, we're glad to be able to have affordable child care and early learning back within the neighborhood, just, you know, a walk away from some of these beautiful new homes that are going to be built. Um, and so the neighborhood plan, are we, here, will you go back one, Tony? So to get this grant, you had to have everybody come together. And when I say everybody, we had to have letters of support from all different agencies. So first we had to convince uh, the city council and mayor to sign off as, as the co-lead. And really it was David Cook because he was going to be signing the checks. And so HUD only gives these grants to communities that show that they can do uh, collaboration well. And then we have a team of people on, um, on the ground that are making it happen. So McCormick Baron Salazar is our developer um, arm. They've done these developments all over the nation and, and win these awards year in and year out with HUD. And then Urban Strategies comes in to provide the case management. But our own uh, Neighborhood Services Department is the neighborhood lead. And so they're responsible for the uh, execution of our critical community improvements, which we thought at the time we submitted our award would have been the hub. Victor will tell you how that all shook out. Um, but we knew that um, we needed really big things to happen to the neighborhood to bring economic development and um, make the neighborhood sustainable and to be able to carry on even after the grant money was gone. So the grant money is only good for six years, you guys. So by 2026, we have to spend every bit of that $35 million. Um, and that won't be hard, but we know that this development will take longer. So we're expecting you know, eight more years of development to get it all done. Um, let's see. Oh, the boundaries. Yeah, that's a good, if you go to the next one. So our boundaries, the north boundary is the railroad track. Um, the western boundary is Miller. The southern boundary is a little bit funny, but it's rainy for the most part, and then it jags a little bit because you know none of our streets are straight here in Stop 6. And then um, we come up on Carverly to the east. And so we have a ton of um, community assets. We have TCC, we have all the schools, and at the same time we're doing this, Fort Worth ISD was investing millions of dollars into Young Men's Leadership Academy, Dunbar, um, and you know, all of these things are happening together, which makes us such a good um, candidate for this grant because we showed that the entire community said yes. Uh, and the other thing, before you start talking about the hub, just so when you're thinking about what you want in the community, I'll let you know some of the things that are going to happen. Hughes House is actually the second phase of housing at Amanda and Rosedale. You can see it being, um, the land's being moved today. You see retaining walls and all that happening. The bottom floor of that will have about 9,000 square feet of commercial space. And so we have the ability to bring in businesses um, on the ground floor there. And really, we want to make sure that we're bringing in the right businesses for the community. So if you were on our community update um, last week, we had um, a, a poll to ask people what they wanted. And we would hope that people were, were sending it out by email. Um, but please, you can just email us. Tell us what you want, because we want to attract the businesses that you'll support and the businesses that would benefit you as a family. Um, but those spaces will be able to lease we're not looking to make money. We're looking to bring the right things to the community, if that makes sense. Um, the other thing that we've been able to secure through partnerships is um, a CVS Workforce Innovation and Talent Center. So the former Boys and Girls Club that was along Rosedale and um, Avenue G at ETA um, is actually going to be transformed into a hub for education and learning to get people back to, to jobs. And so one of the major things they do is train pharmacy techs. 
They come in and retrofit that building free of charge to us, and then they give us a full-time employee to manage education programs out of it. And so it's not just pharmacy tech training, but other types of training, whether it be call center, logistics, things for high-paying jobs. They want to train people to get them into the workforce, and they want to hire as many of them as they can through Aetna and CBS. Um, yeah, so it actually looks like a, a mini CVS. It's branded like CVS, um, and it looks like a pharmacy. The only thing that's not real um, are the drugs. They're M&Ms and Skittles instead of uh, pills. But they have uh, store shelves that look just like a CVS. They train store managers there, um, clerks, inventory, PO at the point of sale system, so people could go out after being trained there and work in a store seamlessly. And so that'll be taking place in the front part of that building. The back half, as you all know, is a gymnasium. Um, and we're turning that into a multi-purpose room that'll have a commercial kitchen um, and some restrooms that'll actually go to the outside because we're having a food truck park and farmer's market um, installed along Rosedale. And so it'll have a canopy with water and lighting so people can come in and park their trucks with shade and hook up and not have to use generators. But it'll also have a stage and a patio and seating it's really going to be a place-making opportunity to have events for the community. So when you think about, let's say it's breast cancer month and we want to do mammogram screenings and have the bus come out, that'd be a great place to have it park and have events there. If we want to do a movie night for kids, it's just going to be a multi-use space for the community that can really uh, hopefully draw people to stop six in a really positive way. So that's all happening right there at Rosedale, right you know, across the street from five, 600 new houses that are going to open up and be a block away. So we're excited. Um, and I hope that you are seeing and, and you will see the dream with me and believe me that it's actually happening. I think Cowan Place is, um, if you've driven by Stall Cup in Rosedale, is really just an amazing thing to see come out of the ground, and we're really proud of it. So um, I'll turn it over to Victor to talk specifically about the hub. Uh, thank you, Mayor Margaret. Uh, you can see on the screen um, location of, of the hub across from Rosedale uh, Plaza Park. She had mentioned earlier about um, the hub and critical community improvements. So initially when we uh, submitted our application to HUD, it included this replacement community center as one of those items. And they no longer fund community centers as part of that. And so uh, we had to uh, switch gears and submit a new plan to HUD. They have to approve what's called those CCIs, Critical Community Improvements. And basically what that is is connecting a neighborhood, accelerating that transformation of the neighborhood, and connecting the housing and the people uh, with the neighborhood. So we had to identify some activities that we could do in the neighborhood to, to meet HUD's approval. So as part of that process, we received a grant from the Urban Land Institute. Uh, it was a Curtis Infrastructure Grant. And we had a panel of real estate experts and planners uh, that came to Fort Worth. Uh, they toured the area. They interviewed stakeholders. Uh, there was a, um, a public meeting on Zoom. Over 80 people participated. But that technical assistance panel over a three-day period, I believe it was February 10th through 12th, uh, 2021, uh, identified 10 things that we could do to submit to HUD, settled on three, which is those community, critical community improvements. And you can see those. Uh, one of them, the very first one, we're talking about the build out of Hughes House. Um, we've been working feverishly to try to uh, get tenants for that. One of the proposals was to have a medical uh, presence, a clinic or some type um, in that space. Uh, we think we have some interested parties, uh, big name medical uh, organizations in Fort Worth that have expressed an interest in being there. Uh, also, the farmer's market food pavilion, so that would be at the new uh, community center. We know that's a way to bring uh, residents together. You see them in different communities around the country, farmer's markets, where we can also bring fresh produce to this area, that being one. And then finally, expansion of our uh, facade improvement program. So uh, commercial facilities, businesses, uh, we can change the appearance, the aesthetics, the uh, exterior of those complexes. So right now we have about, in our current uh, plan or program, 
it's about $30,000 a business can get to improve the exterior of their business. And so we're hoping to expand that and improve several more businesses in, in the area. So the hub, uh, I saw Richard Zavala walk in. So Mary Murray likes to describe it as a community center on steroids is her term. You probably heard her say that many times. And uh, recently, I think it was in 2020, we opened another community center. I won't name the community because I know it's a Redskins cowboy sometime uh, uh, debate. But anyway, it's another community center we recently opened. But this one, it'd be even better, we, we believe. We, we hoping that it has all the amenities and services, uh, not only that are presently here in MLK, but expand on that. However, we know that you're limited in square footage. So if it's not in this in the new location, it will be somewhere in the choice neighborhood boundary. So that's where the Hughes House space and the boys, old boys and girls club that uh, housing authority has that can help uh, serve the community. But you can see the dollar amount. There was a, a bond uh, in 2022 uh, to fund the new center along with aquatics center that our park and recreation department uh, will be heading up. And so we're really proud of those amenities that are going to be part of, part of the hub. And you can see the total dollar amount uh, around 30 plus million dollars. Right now it's around, and I'll let the architects talk a little bit more about it, uh, we had planned for around 28,000 square feet or so, but that, that may be larger than that. Uh, yeah. yeah, you can see that. Yeah, 17 and a half million, 28,000 square feet. You can see the, the amount for the aquatics facility. And then we also have a partnership, Mary Margaret mentioned it earlier, with Child Care Associates to have an early learning center at that location. So it will be um, a pretty expansive and extensive uh, project. Uh, that'll be very comprehensive in nature. I think that was it. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Monique Hill. I'm the district superintendent for the Neighborhood Services Department. That's just a fancy word for an area manager. Um, so I'm responsible for seven of the 21 community centers. I oversee the on-site managers. Um, for those facilities and so Martin Luther King Community Center is one of the uh, facilities that falls under my purview. Um, and so I am just here to kind of give you a quick briefing about uh, the community center and then we're going to get more into the, the, the grits of everything that you wanted to hear about. So Victor mentioned what we are going to be doing. So you'll hear a little bit about the process for uh, building a community center. My, particular emphasis will be on talking about the community center. Uh, you'll see me at meetings where we're asking you, what do you want? What do you want? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem had said it. It's not really Christmas, but we kind of want to know what you want on your list. You may not, Santa may not deliver all of it because that costs. Uh, but I also want to bring your attention to, as we are here today, that we do want to hear from you. You have about two, three, four, five, however many, 50, 10 different ways to tell us. Uh, there is an agenda that we have on the back for you all that love technology. There is a QR code. If you would scan these codes, you can tell us a little bit of something, right? So if you uh, scan these throughout the meeting, information will be feeding into uh, a survey. You don't like that? We got you covered, right, Josh? We got a paper copy. You know, every we got all the measures covered. Fill that out. You can give it to uh, Joshua, or you can leave it at the table. There's a little basket up there for you to put information in. You don't like that? Hey, we got you. We got some index cards. Joshua's been passing those out. We want to hear, can you tell? That don't work for you? No one do none of that? On the back here, there's an email address. Send Nikita an email. You can send that. You don't like this format? We got you. So we're trying to hear from you because we want to know what you think about what is going to happen in the new facility. Um, we want to understand the needs. We do want to make sure that what's already presently here will be in the new facility. So we really are here just to start that process. We've been listening. Uh, there are a lot of studies done with Mary Margaret and the work that was done and all of that was heard, but we want to 
hear it refreshed, okay? So I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Seth now. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Seth, Hen Seth Henry with the Parks and Rec Department. Um, so I am the project manager overseeing um, improvements here at Martin Luther King Park and over at Hub Stop, Stop 6. Um, starting with the uh, Hub Stop 6, we have had several aquatic facilities that we've been working with recently. Um, we uh, moved forward with one other pro project first, we moved forward with Como, and in working through that process we discovered that, um, that we wanted to provide more, pro more programming and um, help assist with the needs that we, we, uh, we were hearing from the community. So um, we initially had a lower budget for the, for the aquatics facilities here at Hub Stop 6, but we've actually increased them up to 8.2 million. Uh, that's going to include... Say that again. Use the word increase. Say that again. Increase. Increase. So um, we are going to have a eight-lane uh, pool facility with a 25-yard lap pool and a interactive play area with um, some any additional facilities that are that will help benefit that project. We have not uh, looked into the programming exactly yet, but that's something we would be looking into. Um, we will work with the community to get the input that we would want. Um, so we're providing exactly what is wanted and needed for the community. And um, but some of the items we are pushing for is lifeguards, um, swimming lessons, and drowning prevention. Then uh, over on Martin Luther King. Uh, we will be moving forward with the demolition of this building at some point once we have opened and have a fully operational Hub Stop 6 facility. And right now we have that targeted for fiscal year 2026. If it happens sooner that we are able to um, get that project roll, this project rolling here, we will move forward with that. Um, but through the funding, we anticipate at least uh, demoing this existing building and repairing the site to a natural park setting. If there are additional monies at that time, we will then design additional facilities or amenities into the park. Then, uh, and actually within this year, we are starting a, another design project here at Martin Luther King Park. So we'll be having some community meeting, input meetings for that here pretty soon. So, um, you know, look forward to that and we, we do hope that you come. Um, this is, we wanna make sure that when we bridge that gap to the changes that are coming here, that this is still a very important park for, for the community that is a, a good reflection of the Hub Stop 6. Everybody appreciating good news so far? Yes. yes. Don't you wish others were here? Yes. I'll take blame for that and we'll do better. The good thing is that this meeting is being videotaped. And as soon as they clean up you know, any inappropriate words I may have said, you know, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll put that on, on the website and I'll share that with all of our key stakeholders. I am so glad to meet this guy for the, for the second time in person. And Christopher McGraw is a senior associate with Harrison Kornberg, Kornberg Architects, a very well-known firm, and we are in very good hands with their design. I will tell you, when we were planning for Cowan Place, how that would look, Mary Margaret was getting pushback about how big is it going to be and all that stuff. And I think that's Michael Bennett, right? Right, Brian, who did, okay. And so I told Michael Bennett, another well-known firm, I said, look, when you build Cowan, that's going to be the gateway to stop six. I need that to be big and bold and make people wonder, where am I? And one thing Mary Margaret didn't tell you, and we always talk about this, Mary Margaret, that tower you see at Cowan Place, when Dunbar Wildcats are playing, that light's gonna be blue. <laughs> okay? When it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, it's gonna be pink. I don't know about cowboys, you know, but maybe there's a silver light if they're winning. I'm a fair weather fan, okay? But, I just want you to know that they're making every effort to make sure that structure, that complex, that hub is a part of this community. Because once you cross 820, you're in stop six. I don't want you to just rush on through because you're scared. 
I want you to stop and shop, live, work, and play. That is going to be happening. That is going to be happening. Now, before I bring up the architect, I have to thank a couple of special ladies who I used as a focus team, and they, they didn't know it, and I didn't really think of the formal word to tell y'all that's what y'all were, but I'd like for Sylvia and Sharon to please stand. Sylvia and Sharon Armstrong, please stand. Okay. Thank you. If you know MLK Center, you know these ladies. Sharon is like a big sister growing up in my dad's church. I've known her all my life. And I've never met such a neighborhood zealot until I, zealot until I met Sylvia Allen. And so thank you all for all the work that you did to get people here today. So now let's talk about, is it proper to say what it's going to look like? <laughs> what, how, 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 how do I, how, what do I say? We'll talk about the process of how we get to. Okay, okay. So I'm jumping the gun then. Okay, well, I've, I won't be going Facebook Live on that. But please, please welcome Christopher with a K. Well, thank you all. Um, it's always hard to follow an elected official, so I'll see what I can do. Um, so again, I'm Christopher McGraw. I'm representing Harrison Kornberg Architects. Uh, I manage our North Texas operations. Um, first thing, I'd like to thank uh, the city for having us here. It's exciting to be here. Uh, and it's nice to meet you all. I know I've seen many faces on this side of the room, but I don't believe I've seen any faces on this side. So great to meet you all. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our firm. We're going to talk a little bit about the process and then get kind of a general overview of the project. Um, so Harrison Kornberg Architects, we've been in business about 20 years. I've been there, I think, 17 or 18 of those 20 years. Uh, as you can see on the screen, we've done about uh, $1.7 billion worth of construction costs in the public sector alone, uh, as well as uh, is it 12, wow, that's a lot of square footage, wow. <laughs> um, the, the point of this slide is essentially to say we do a lot of work in the public realm. Uh, this is not our first time doing this type of work. We work with various cities um, uh, across the uh, state of Texas. Uh, this is just a list of some of our, our few, few lists, few of our clients, rather. Uh, City of Dallas, you'll see DFW, Fort Worth ISD. Uh, for those, I know there's been a lot of talk about Dunbar. You're going to see uh, some slides and images of O.D. Wyatt. We were just selected to do the work. Hopefully no one holds it against us. <laughs> um, so we, we've won some awards. I don't like to dwell on this. It always feels a little weird to talk about yourself, but we've, we've been fortunate enough to be awarded some, uh, some uh, accolades for the work we've done. Um, and we wanted to show this slide just to let you know, while I'm here today you know, representing the firm, we do have a full uh, slate of people that are working across our various offices uh, that will be helping on the project as needed. Uh, and then we're collaborating with Brinkley Sergeant Wigington on this project. Uh, they'll be our collaborating architect. They've got about 45 years of, of experience. Uh, they've done a lot of work with aquatic centers uh, and as well as community centers. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we had uh, noted that they'll be on part of, part of the team. Uh, so a little bit of our experience. I won't dwell on this very much, but we wanted to show a few images of work that we've worked on over the last 20 years. Um, most of these are for clients that are, are uh, in the public realm. I think all of them actually. Uh, if you go to the next slide, one thing I was remiss to say, including on our client list, is uh, the bottom image is for the University of North Texas at the Health Science Center. So that's a parking garage here in the Fort Worth area. Uh, so uh, the point there being we have worked in Fort Worth before. Uh, this is not the first time we've worked here. Uh, so that was kind of an overview of our projects. What we wanted to focus on is highlight a few of the centers we've worked on. Um, so this is a recreation and wellness center for the University of Houston at Clear Lake. Um, so you've seen the interior shot and, this, uh, and an exterior shot. Uh, next, Judson Robson Community Center. This is for the city of Houston. Uh, and then this is a student wellness and a success center for University of Houston downtown. Uh, 
so again, that's just a little bit of what we do. Uh, we're going to give a, a quick overview of the project, just kind of, I, I think you've heard many of these things before, um, but just to recap, uh, the numbers you're going to see here, I noticed it as, as others were talking, these numbers are a little bit different, but what these numbers are, the construction cost limitation. And essentially what that means is this is the amount of the dollars you saw before that are available for construction. Uh, now we're going to talk about the process a little bit. So uh, you've heard others speak about it before. Generally what happens is there's sort of a community engagement and a collection of data component. So a lot of that work happened before we were involved with the project. That's when di different groups are going out to the community, they're trying to figure out what the needs are and they're starting the process of figuring things out. We came in uh, at what's called the programming phase and we'll talk a little bit more about what those are uh, uh, in, a, in a moment. At the end of programming is when you move into the design phases. That's when you start to get to an understanding of what the building will look like. We start documenting it. That's where you may have heard the term blueprints, floor plans. That's when those kind of things come about. Uh, and then the project goes into construction after that. Um, so programming. Uh, as a general overview, we like to say that's essentially us working with the stakeholders, the community, whomever is part of that process to understand what the requirements are for the project. Um, what we like to say is, even though we've been selected as, as the architect and we've done this before, it's not our building. It's you all's building. So what we're trying to do is understand what you all want, what the city wants, what the requirements are, and we don't come in with a preconceived notion, which is why I was mentioning earlier, we have no idea what the building is going to look like. Right now, we're just trying to understand what are the needs, what are the requirements. And so we'll have meetings, you saw photos there, various meetings where we're talking, we're asking questions. What the result of that is, is what we call, uh, this is an example of a kind of a template where we have room data sheets and we have um, sort of template spaces. Even though this looks like a hard line drawing, like everything is figured out, it's not. It's just our way of saying, okay, here's what we've heard. We're gonna go space by space and try to identify, is this what you mean? It doesn't mean that's what it's gonna look like in the end of the building. It's just us doing test fits. Do things fit? How big do they need to be? And so we do this generally space by space. This is just an example. Um, and then we list in written form all the things that we've heard and all the things we think we understand about what those spaces are. Uh, the other things we're looking at is what the site will look like uh, in terms of utilities that might be on the site, topography. Uh, we're trying to understand the priorities. We're trying to define expectations. But again, none of this is really a building yet. Once we move past that phase and everything's signed off on, that's when we move into the design phases. So the first phase is called schematic design. That's where we're generally figuring out the form of the building and the adjacency and arrangement of the spaces. We're starting to think about what it might look like. We're starting to think about what the materials might be, but it's mostly about a general overall view of the form and arrangement of the building. Uh, and this, these three images are all from the same project because we wanted to explain how the phases go. So you see in the first one, I don't know if you can tell from the back, those are kind of, you know, we may have even colored some of that by hand. I can't remember. We were thinking that it might be this material, but we weren't quite sure yet. When you move into design development, as the name implies, that's when the design is developed. That's when we start to say, okay, we're making decisions, we're understanding what the materials are, we're finalizing many of those items, we're finalizing the arrangement, and so in this case, uh, the original drawing and thought was it was going to be terracotta panels. In the middle, it actually ended up being brick. And so you'll see now you're getting into a much more photorealistic image of what the building is intended to be. Then we move into construction documents. That's where we're essentially coming up with the details and basically coming up with the, the contract, if you will, contract documents that go to the contractor so they understand the design intent and what they need to build. So just to recap the whole overview, programming, schematic design, design development, construction documents, 
We've added two more here that are kind of outside of the design phases. There's a procurement phase. This is when the contractor is bidding the documents. This is usually when it's going for permitting. This is when all that sort of all the design phases are culminating into something that can actually get a building that's constructed. And then obviously at the end, the, the goal is to have a constructed building. Uh, so where we are right now in terms of the process is we're in the programming phase. So you heard a lot about, uh, we want to hear input from you, we want to know what, what, what you all want in the building. Uh, and as you can see, again, just to reiterate, right now it's just a collection of pieces. There is no building. We have no idea what it looks like. Contrary to there, there have been some in the rooms that say, you've probably drawn this already and it's in your office. We have not. <laughs> we thought about it, we have some ideas. But we've not, and, and we intentionally resist that because we don't want our preconceived notions to kind of force you all in a direction or not. We'd rather step back and say, we have no idea what the end result is gonna be. Send all the information in, we'll go through that information, and that information then will help for determine ultimately what the building looks like. So with that, again, we're very excited, excited to be here, excited to be working on the project. Uh, I'll be around for a while afterwards if people have questions, um, but don't make them too difficult because we're just in the programming phase. Thank <laughs> Thanks, you. everyone. And as we wind down, Christopher, I'm reminded of that first Zoom meeting when we met, and I told you, I don't know what you've been told, but don't start on anything until you hear from my people. I think you know now that that was Good. Now, let me tell you what we're going to do next. And I'm going to ask two questions, and it's not to embarrass anybody. And Chris, you don't have to raise your hand because Frank was here. If you came in after we started, please raise your hands. For those of you with your hands raised, do you have internet? Okay, okay. Because we're not going to do this meeting all over again. <laughs> But what we will do is make sure you have a link so you'll know everything that was discussed and who said it, okay? Well, I mean, we can't do that. Now, here's the next thing, and this is really, I think, the most important point of this meeting. There are a lot of people in this room, and I bet everybody has a question. We can get everybody's question answered if you follow this rule, and I'm gonna give you examples, okay? I did the same thing with Woodhaven, so it's not because I'm in stop six. We're gonna open the floor for questions. Questions start with who, what, where, when, how, and why. Questions don't start with your history. They don't start with a political speech. They don't start with your opinion. And so it's very, very important to me that we get everybody's question recorded. And what I want you to do when you get ready for your question, we wanna hear your name, because Josh is gonna write it down. And Josh, you're gonna make sure that that person asking a question sign that sheet so we know who, who we're looking at, okay? Does anybody have a problem with that rule? Okay, thank you. Again, I wanna thank you for being here today. I am so very excited. And I will tell you that there were two reasons why I decided to run for office one more time, because I really was done. But it's because of the Stop Six Project and because of Lakes of River Trails. Those, those are the two reasons. And so what that means to people is I am laser focused on those two projects. You can't get in my way with, with cr crazy, because we gotta get these projects done. Stop Six is very important to me because we're seeing people move back to Stop Six. Now that's good, and for some, some of y'all don't want people back. It, it, I'm serious. It's, it's like houses are too close, uh -huh. but they're coming back. And I, I mean, that's a good thing because it means property tax monies are coming in and we're getting our fair share. And finally, before I open up for questions, David, when are you gonna adopt this budget? When do you wanna, is that September 21? 19th. 19th, okay. So you're going to be reading City News, and I understand City News doesn't come out like it used to every day. It's like twice a week now. We, gotta, we, we need to go, to go back so we can let people know what's happening. 
but I need you all to be a part of the budget process. I don't know what you want if you don't tell me. I don't know what you want if you put it on Facebook and think I'm following you, not. And I'm sure I'm not following next door. So we have a formal process to get input on what you want. Whatever that is, turn it off. Okay, thank you. And so with that, anybody have any questions? Okay, I saw Chris, I saw Sharon, Christine. Is this a different phase from what we did prior to? This is the community center, this is the, this phase. Mm -hmm. And the other phase was um, the area and what we Yeah, and, and that was part of my introduction, how we got here. I took us back all the way to Frank's meetings in 2009 and how they build on each other. Yeah, but that's okay. I, I just wanted to know if this is a new phase because we're giving new input. It, it's, I, I would say it's more detailed input because we actually voted on the hub. And so now we're getting the details for the hub. And so you can just look at it as expansion. And you know you got my number. Sharon. I don't have a question, but I do have a comment because people call me. I know. And, I, know. And I mean, uh, <clears throat> mother folks. Ask, but their, anyway, ask their question. My, my comment is thank you. Okay. Mm. Thank everybody Mary Margaret, thank for you. what you are doing in this area. And it is a multicultural area. Yes, it's it is. not just uh, black folks, white folks, it's multicultural. Mm -hmm. So please. And please remember that and yeah. thank you. Mary Barbara, take a stand. Victor, take a stand. Fernando, stand up, please. Brian, stand up, please. Michelle Booth. Sonia. She drops that, that loving bomb and walks out the door. <laughs> okay, Lewis, whatever you buy Sharon today is on me, okay? Got you. Next question, Sylvia. Yeah, I have a question. Um, she said, don't make it personal. But I did uh, hear in the plan about the community, it's going to be a stage, and you'll be able to do a lot of events. I couldn't hardly retain in my seat because everybody knows why, so I'm not going to say anything personal. But my question is, do anybody have any idea, Jonathan, what year is that stage going to be so that I can rest good at night? Because I'm really, really excited about to have a stage. See that man in front of you with, with no hair on the top? <laughs> that, that, that's who will eventually give you some dates. He's our point person. Next question. I don't know your name. Oh, you, uh, Juigi Lockhart, I, I, was, I went to high school with your dad. He was a couple of years older than me. Your question, please. All right. His dad was such a good looker. Yes, so I can. Now, my question is just, how can we access this uh, presentation? Uh, um, if you signed in, we'll send it to you. Send it to you. Okay, uh -huh. great. Mm -hmm. And for those of y'all who've been hanging out with Josh, make sure he knows you want it. But uh, I know I'll put it on my Facebook page. Michelle, you want to talk more about it? The microphone. Um, we'll get the um, video and post it on YouTube, and then we'll put the link on the Stop 6 Hub page. But we'll also give it to Josh so he can send it to everybody. Yeah, we are communicating. Next question. Yes. What's your name? Levita. Okay. Oh, okay. I didn't know you with the cap on. Okay. So uh, my question is: Is there a definitive plan for this part? Place? Yeah, it's going down. It's going down. The building's going to be demolished. It will remain park space, but this won't go down until we have the new building. We're in it. Right. In 2026. You want to add? To, did I do it right, Fernando? You want to add to it? I well, just wanted to add that the reason the building is proposed to be demolished is because 
it's not in good condition, it's not economically feasible to rehabilitate it, uh, and therefore, because it's not going to be safe in the long run, it is safe now, but in the long run, it'll be better for it to be completely replaced. It'll be demolished. We had extensive discussions with community leaders, and I believe everybody agreed. In fact, the city council adopted a resolution saying we intend to demolish it, but uh, actually convert it into parkland. And uh, Richard Zavala was part of that uh, discussion, and uh, we're committed to do it. Right. And I understand the park, that it's going to be a park. Yes, ma'am. But what exactly is going to be? Well, uh, you heard from our parks department. We will talk with you at another meeting about what's going to be here, what you want to be here okay. in the park. Okay. Thank you. I'll tell you one thing that's already here, and that's because uh, from Dr. Gwen Morrison, she noticed a few years ago we didn't have walk uh, markers to let you know how far you've, you've walked. If you look at Bunch Park, well, Dr. Morrison got that here. If you go to Bunch Park, you'll see very nice equipment. If, I mean, and so it, it really will be a park. We're not going to create a new definition for park. But what's in there is where your input comes in. And so you'll have Seth's contact on the program, Seth Henry. You'll have our contact when those meetings take place, just like we did at Bunch Park. We'll get in, input from people. And another thing, I was looking at Vicki Hudson, who retired from here, as Fernanda was talking about the building and the, and the shape that it's in, she was going, oh. this building is more than 40 years old. And the city is not interested in maintaining anything 40 years old, nor can we give it away to your church, okay? And so, you know, well, that, that's, that's been a request, but uh, it's time for new. And, and what I really don't like, I don't like the neighborhood being disrupted with big events. I don't like a whole bunch of strange cars in my neighborhood. So we're gonna be big and new. Uh, Councilman Moss, I saw your hand, but I hope you can also say something about the need and the importance of, an, of a natatorium, if you will. It's, it's critical, uh, it's critical. Because, you know, people from this neighborhood have to go out to other, off of campus or to Tarrant County Community College. So, and, and of course the health department talks about the need to have uh, places where people can do aerobics uh, because we've got big demand here. Mm -hmm. But uh, so that, that's critical that we, that we have there, which just unfortunate it's not uh, for 12 months a year. But mm -hmm. that, that, that would be a concern, but I think that we could probably uh, go forward without that. Uh, the question that I had in, during the previous presentations about uh, whether there's any funds to do anything to this particular property once you move out. Seth? Once the facility over at Hub 6 is open and running and fully functional, we will then uh, we will begin the process of demolition for this building. And then at that time, we will at minimum be returning the park to a, a natural setting. Um, if we have additional funds, then we will add additional amenities to the site. Uh, but we do want to connect the two, the two pieces we have since the building is kind of in the middle of the entire property. And we know one way to get additional funds is, what's that four letter word? Bond issue. We have always been real successful with bond issues. One thing that you didn't mention, Frank, that I'll promise you, we'll do everything we can and should to maintain the crepe myrtle theme that you established. And as you look at those trees down, down the, middle, the middle of Rosedale, you'll see crepe myrtles and other trees, but out of receipt. How many trees did y'all plant in Rosedale Park? I think it's Rosedale Park. Association. Uh, it was about 100, right at 200. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that warrants respect and us doing everything we can to make sure we can get that and we can also connect with Eastside Blossoms, Jerry Barton's group. I love crepe myrtles. Any other questions? I see a hand back there. I don't yes, you know me, Gina. This is Myrtle. Yeah. How you doing? Bye. My sister was talking about you the other day. Oh, I hope it was good. It was good. It was good. I'm Myrtle Johnson work for Solutions. I'm sorry. And you, I wish you guys would come to the hub. That's what I'm asking about. Because I mean, you mentioned the CBS Workforce Innovation and Training Center. So I was, and, and you've got some specific, you know, industries you already talked about there. So I was trying to see, are you open to a dialogue of expanding, you know, other kinds of... Let, let me tell you the reason, the, the reason why I had been holding off 
on efforts to make final decisions on the hub is because I wanted to make sure the services that were needed are there. Now, I believe MHMR should be there. I believe Workforce Solutions should be there. And Fernando, what I'd like to do, David, can you hear me? I want y'all to work on this. What I want to do is be the point person to convene a meeting with service providers who we know have interest in 76105. And that would include Workforce Solutions. And so it, it, it's, we, we just can't afford to get this wrong. I mean, we really can't, it, and it, it bothers me. It, 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 it's a burden for me to make sure we leave no stone unturned. And so, Merville, thank you for speaking up, but you were one of the first ones I mentioned. Then David mentioned MHMR. We cannot afford to get this wrong. And so, you know, I don't want people clamoring here because it's new and shiny and everything. We need people with entities and organizations here who can meet the needs of people in Stop 6. John, what's your new job? Um, I'm the family communication <clears throat> specialist for Dunbar Hospital. <laughs>
Mm -hmm. Last question. I wasn't going to ask this publicly, but is the procurement going to be the same for the hub as Calvin Place and Blue's House? I don't know, Fernando. My, the line, the line the MWBE. Our diversity and inclusion department will be uh, working uh, with property management to ensure that we provide every opportunity for local contractors, particularly uh, minority women uh, business enterprises, to participate in the construction of the Stop 6 Hub. That's real important. It has been real important in connection with Cowan Place, and it will be uh, for Hughes House and every other phase of this project. It's not about doing things for the community. It's about doing things with the community. And it's important for the community to benefit at every stage of the process. And so we take uh, that procurement process seriously. Uh, and if it's not done right, it's not going to be done. It's going to be done right. And uh, we want to provide every opportunity for local contractors to participate. Thank you. Thanks, Fernando. Jonathan, I have an assignment for you, and then we're going to close this meeting. I need you to draft me some kind of communique so that everybody here can become uh, missionaries on this trip, and they can explain what we're trying to, to get here. And if, if you send that to me between now and Monday, we'll get that out. Because I know many of you are wondering, okay, what do I tell people? What can I say? Why is it important? And so we'll get that to you. I the uh, Stop 6 really is home. My, my garage stayed up one night until about 3 a.m. in the morning. My garage was up. A neighbor called, Gina, do you know your garage is up? So Stop 6 is home. I want to thank you all for coming. And again, Merville, thank you, thank you, thank you for voicing that because it validates my paranoid concern, okay? And for those of you who have ideas after the fact, you can't send us too many emails. I promise you, you cannot. Thank you for coming. I want to thank staff for giving up part of their day because this, you know, this is a haul. I want to thank the architect for showing up. Nice socks you got there, I see. And this has been a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monique.